but it actually changed the way that I started looking at life. And the more I wanted to put a mask on, the more I wanted to make out that life was awesome when it wasn't, I soon realized A, that was exhausting and B, I ended up with a lot of people that perhaps weren't the right people to be in my life. So once I sort of decided, you know what, I'm just gonna take the mask off and be free of this, my village became smaller, but it became so much tighter, so much more warmth, so much more love, so much more emotion. And the most important thing, I suppose, it, it, was, it was real. Welcome to the podcast, Gus. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's lovely to have a chat. So, Gus, I've heard you say the bravest thing you can do is tell someone how you truly feel. Yeah. So what I would love to know, Gus, is what was the moment in your life where you came to understand how important it is to tell someone how you truly feel? I suppose for me, I've always worn my heart on my sleeve and that has been really good and bad. I've had, you know, sometimes telling a girlfriend after one day that you love them <laughs> is probably not the smartest thing to do. But You're that guy, are you? Feel- <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I sort of felt at the time that's how I felt, you know, and right. at the time when you were a 16, 7 year old I never felt anything like this before. This must be love. So <laughs> this is what I'm feeling. But and for some girls, you know, they thought that was wonderful. And other girls, it was like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. um, but I suppose as I've got older, I mean, I really believe my life changed when once I'd done the Man Up documentary. So that mm-hmm. was I was around about 47 then. And I'd had three children, been married to the same lady. Um, and I felt that I was sort of stumbled across something out of so much sadness and so much emotion that it actually changed the way that I started looking at life. And the more I wanted to put a mask on, the more I wanted to make out that life was awesome when it wasn't, I soon realised, A, that was exhausting, and B, I ended up with a lot of people that perhaps weren't the right people to be in my life. So once I sort of decided, you know what, I'm just going to take the mask off and be free of this, my village became smaller, but it became so much tighter, so much more warmth, so much more love, so much more emotion. And the most important thing, I suppose, it it was it was real. And I suppose that was the key for me to go, you know what, don't care about what everyone else thinks, you know, and sometimes you're going to miss out on opportunities because you don't quite fit the PC mode. But you know what, you've got to be real. And that's that that was that moment. So it took me a while. I mean, I had a few lives before I got to 47. I had a sales life. I ran a pub in England. I traveled quite a bit, got married, had the three children, and then stumbled across media at 38. And nearly 10 years into that, did I really work out that being real was the best. And as a radio host as well, FM radio in Sydney, it's all about jokes. It's all about sports. It's all about rock music on Triple M. One day I sat down with my co-host and said, well, why don't we talk about being married to the same lady for 20 plus year, all of us, we've all been, we're all in that situation. We've all got teenage kids. We've never really spoken about with any sort of vulnerability about how we actually are as men and how we're coping and so forth. And two sportsmen I was on with, you know, what's the transition been like for you guys? It's been difficult, even though you've been able to get into into media, but you must have friends and old teammates. So One morning I spoke with vulnerability about my friend Angus who had taken his own life and that changed my life because the lady who then produced Man Up was driving her kids to school and heard the story about my friend who ticked all the boxes, who took his own life and I never quite understood it. And the the lines at Triple M completely blew up. We have 32 lines for competitions and people to phone in to talk. People were phoning in saying, thank you for your story, but I want to tell you my story as well. We've all got one. We've all got that person that has touched us or that moment in our life where we'd like to do things differently or I'd love a do-over on that. So all of a sudden it just opened up this beautiful safe space for our radio station to talk about things, what I call conversations of gravity, outside of banter where we're very comfortable with banter, we're not so much with gravity. So that got me thinking and then the Man Up show came and then Gotcha for Life came and I suppose I'm, I'm living it now. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I really respect you, particularly as a man, you know, I even saw on the Gotcha for Life website, you know, you you identified as a man that quote unquote had it all. And I feel like, you know, people like you really 
make ripple like have ripple effects in our society because you're generally people that we look up to and we 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 go oh we want what they have but we truly don't understand the inner worries that we all experience and I really honor you for sharing that so in relation to conversation what is one of the most powerful conversations that you've had in your life yeah I suppose the one where when I was going through the Man Up program, I was about 15 days into filming. We had 65 days to film. And so I was sort of in the groove, getting to know the crew. And the, it was the documentary. So it was me being me. So there was no scripting going on. So, and I sat there one day and I watched someone else do some work. And I was watching this guy called Tom Harkin, who I now support. And I'm trying to build up his programs called Tomorrow Man and Tomorrow Woman. That's where a lot of the finance goes to. That I, that I fundraise and he was at my son's school and my son was about 15. In that room, there was probably 15 boys. I knew about five or six and we we wanted to make sure that it was a group of boys, not just, just not my son Jack's mates. So I knew a few, I didn't know a few and I was watching through a monitor in another room and I couldn't stop crying because I saw five or six boys that I've known since kindy show emotion that they've never shown before and I know all their fathers and their mothers and their family. And I'm like, should I be telling their fathers and stuff that this emotion mm. is literally just under the surface? Like these guys were within 15 minutes of being with Tom were howling. They were crying. They were hugging each other. It was, it was beautiful, but it just goes to show how much these young boys in particular at the time were just strutting around as if everything was fine and they had all the answers. But if you just give them a safe enough place to have a proper conversation, you realize how, they're really struggling with a lot of stuff and we need to support them and get them through this stuff. So I went through all sorts of emotion and my son came out and he gave me the biggest hug. And I'm like, wow, this is like, it was a moment. And I went home that day after filming and I sat with my son, Jack, and he said, dad, that was fantastic. That's the best day of school I've ever had. And I said, that's amazing, Jack. I had no idea what today was going to be like. It was just another day in the filming for me, but I, I noticed how much, the guys were clicked onto this and how much they loved it. Anyway, it got us onto a conversation which answers your question, which is me saying to my son, I've pretty much been bullshitting to you the last 15 years about having all the answers. And every time you've asked me something, you know, I don't lie to you, but it's sort of with a bit of experience and a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of know-how, I sort of scramble-ish the right <laughs> answer. And we get there in the end. <laughs> And he looked at me and he's like, oh, he was so relieved because he thought at the age of about 18, when they turn into a man, that he all of a sudden he had to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting there as a 15-year-old going, I don't know anything. Not long and off. He, <laughs> exactly. So he was like, God, there's a, there's, there's, there's a line there that I need to learn right. a lot in the next three years. And it just took the pressure off him. And it made him realise that we are all bumbling through life we're all looking for the light switch in the dark at a hotel room that we don't normally sleep in. We are doing the best we possibly can and we are a big dysfunctional society that are just having a crack. And that just took the pressure off him and all of a sudden he was a different kid. So I think that was the moment. Me showing vulnerability and saying, you know what, I'm not the man that you probably think I am um, was just the best thing. It set us both free. So in that classroom I'm really intrigued because I feel like you know we can use the example of young boys but I feel like you know this is due to society right so these young boys have learned from older men so we're sort of talking about one and the same thing in that mm. in that room with those boys what was it that you saw that changed was it the you know obviously as you're saying it's it's men being vulnerable but was it also the creation of that safe space that's exactly it. It's the safe space being created. So we never create that safe space. Mm -hmm. We are so busy just sort of connecting, sort of disconnecting, talking talking trash, having a go, taking the piss, all that stuff, never having any silence in a conversation with a group of mates because as soon as it's silent, people are looking around going, oh, this is shit, this is shit, I've got to get out of this, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So all of a sudden you put them in a safe place and you realise that they just slow down enough to go, okay, mm -hmm. this is different okay, if this is different, then I can act differently. And I've sort of been given permission to be something that I don't normally give myself permission to be. So that was the moment. And, you know, we see it all the time now. We had one before shut down in Sydney, 257 blokes turned up at Avalon Surf Lifesaving wow. Club. 
and blokes are walking in there going, I thought I'd be the only one here tonight. Wow. And you can see they were going, I don't know what this is about. I'm out of my comfort zone. Well, two and a half hours later, we had the most magnificent big hug of the whole room, you know, pre-COVID. And we were just all hugging each other and people turned around and said, I just feel so much better because I thought I was the only one that was having a bit of trouble with the missus. I'm the only one that can't talk to my son or daughter anymore. Um, I thought I was the only one that had some financial stress. There was so much stuff that everyone was coping with and people just, you just feel better if you're part of a tribe or a village that's going through the same sort of thing. And that's what I'm talking about with Gotcha for Life now is simplifying this mental fitness chat. I call it mental fitness, not mental health, because I feel like mental fitness gives you a positive to look at and you can scale yourself one to 10 and get exercises and tips and tricks to get better. So we're all on this journey together. It's so much better if we're in a team or in a village or a family or whatever it might be. So that's what it's all about is allowing yourself, I suppose, the vulnerability and to be strong enough to go, you know what, I do need some help. Um, And once you've got that tribe around you, if you look at the big world, it's huge. But just look at your own little crew. Look at your family, look at your loved ones. And that's what I say. And I'll be doing a chat at 11.15 this morning with, with, with a corporation, five and a half thousand people. And it's really hard to get the energy back from that. Like you and I have got good energy here. It's one-on-one. But when I'm just looking at the biggest Brady Bunch family you've ever seen and they're all, they're all muted and half of them are probably, you know, are on but cameras off and they're mowing the lawn or having a beer or whatever. Exactly. You know, doing, doing whatever they do, like what? So they wanted to listen to me for an hour about mental fitness. But what I say to everyone is just get a pen and paper and write down all the relationships that you absolutely love and adore that you cannot imagine your life being without. So write those all down and then take a moment to give yourself a mark out of 10 for how you're performing within that relationship. And if it's not an eight, nine or 10 out of 10, then go to work and start making that relationship better. And that means using technology, sending a text message, FaceTiming rather than phoning um, or phoning rather than texting, however you want to do it, technology has stood up to the test of time in the last 18 months. So use it and stay connected with people. Connection is the key to human existence. We are throwing away perfect and we are becoming human again. And we should slow down enough to realise it and also realise that we have to do things differently. All these stats, these horrible numbers that we hear every day, seven blokes a day, three ladies a day, 65,000 attempts of suicide a year. That's one every 28 seconds the ambulance has rung in this country to say, please save me. So mm-hmm. I've run over those numbers quickly, but seven men, three ladies, 65,000 attempts. We have not got our shit together in this country. We are getting better. Awareness is better. Absolutely. But we still don't have the action that goes behind it. So we need to throw away perfect, throw away the social media, you know, Instagram way of looking at life and really getting in the the nitty gritty with people that you love make those relationships that you've written down and you say that you can't live without well time to stand up put a line in the sand and make it happen we are not taking relationships for granted anymore we just can't because the stats will tell us if we don't change the way that we look at things then we will continue to go down the same path and we've said zero suicides that got you for life that's it number one one is too many so the only way we'll get there i believe is by getting more emotional muscle to have these conversations so we don't worry alone Oh, that's powerful, Gus. <laughs> I'm taking it all in and I'm all behind you. And I think something that's so important in relation to this, because I've really reflected on on your drive and everything that you're doing. It's just absolutely amazing. And I think, you know, I resonated with an aspect because obviously this is this is focused on the masculine, on the men. And when I was in my early 20s, so say a bit over 10 years ago, I was in a relationship where my partner was suicidal and he did not reach out or talk to anyone or share that with anyone. And it really created a burden on me because of his shame of being able to go, you know, of what he was experiencing with his mental fitness. I took that on me as I need to be the fixer. So I think in this conversation as well, it's so important that the caregiver or the partner who was on the other side of the person having a hard time that you also 
connect with other people and have a conversation with other people. Like this isn't just about obviously gotcha for life is more focused on men, but you're supporting men and women programs outside of that. But it's just in general about being human and having a conversation and connecting with people and, and being vulnerable. And and I guess as you're saying, I think you, you share be open, honest and vulnerable in that conversation. Yeah. Exactly. And I feel for you. And thank you for sharing that with your partner. And, and do you know if he's okay now? Is he, is I he all right? I didn't keep in contact with him, but I think definitely things have improved that I'm aware of. Um, but I definitely know in that point, it was it was really sad. He came from, um, you know, which we can generally see sometimes like a challenging background. And he just mm. didn't know how to, he didn't have the tools to deal with what to do. And because he wasn't used to close relationships as well, that wasn't what he was seeking out. And I think, you know, it's a commonality between a lot of us, unfortunately. So it feels foreign, even when you say, you know, it's a good rate yourself how good of a friend you're being in terms of communication. Like I can resonate with that. Sometimes I can get a douse of loneliness, but if you were to ask me how much effort I put into my friendships, particularly at the moment, I haven't been able to travel or anything, you know, I'd, I'm not that high on the on the list. So I love and thank you for, for putting that out there because it certainly got me reflecting on the fact that, yeah, I need to put a lot more effort in and and more effort in terms of not just a text message or anything like that as well, but but getting the FaceTime on if we can't get out there because obviously a lot of us are in lockdown at the moment as well and making more of an effort. And it might be a little uncomfortable, but to lean into sort of that uncomfortable place because I have no doubt that any time that I've sort of had a conversation on the phone or FaceTime or anything, it might be a little bit of a push at the start, but it always makes me feel really good when I get off it. Of course. And that's what I talk about, the mental fitness side of things. The first time you go to the gym and your personal trainer's there and you're sitting there going, I'm paying for this? Are you serious? Yeah. Like, what am I paying? I'm getting flogged here. Then you wake up the next morning and you're like, oh, I can't even shampoo my hair. Yeah. And I'm like, Jesus, I can't lift my hair. Well, in a month's time, ask the same person, are you happy that you're stuck with the personal trainer? Are you happy that you've gone to the gym three or four times in the week? Are you happier now that your jeans fit a bit better or whatever it might be, whatever your goal is, to be healthier or slimmer or whatever it might be, it'll be easier a month in a month's time if you stick with it. But life will throw all sorts of curveballs at you. So that's why the mental fitness thing is give yourself a break, realise it's hard, but just get in the grind. Just start the ball rolling and become a better friend. Be kind, you know, be a better human being and just look after your village. That You might be too young to know this saying, but it, they used to say it takes a village to bring up a child. It, it takes a village to bring up a human being. Which means back in the old days, you know, Tom and Jerry were running around here. Well, the next door neighbours knew where they were and they shouted across to, oh, no, they're over here. Don't worry about it. I'll keep mm. an eye on them. And then someone would feed them or they'd use their tap for a bit of water. And then they'd be up at the shops grabbing something for lunch and whatever. And everyone would just know, oh, yeah, I saw Tommy. It was a village that brought up all these children. Well, we need to get back to that in terms of our own crew. And that's why writing it down and giving yourself an honest mark out of 10, that's the moment. And you said you need to put more effort into it yourself. It's not necessarily more effort. It's just a bit more of a consistent effort, mm -hmm. you know, just letting them know, setting them a little meme, saying um, this just popped up on Facebook. Um, it reminded me of something. Or I remember the last time you and I did went out dancing and we did that. And it just it allows connection and we as humans need to feel connection. If we don't feel connection, then we start to go down a lonely path and uh, loneliness, I think, is the is literally the worst thing. It's a, I believe that suicide's a death of loneliness. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to speak to well over a thousand people that are still with us that actually tried to take their own life as part of what I do. And not one of them wanted to die, but they all wanted to be out of pain. They're in so much pain. They opened their eyes every morning and they were so heavy. They were so exhausted and the pain was just unrelenting. So not to have to the, the thought of me having people that I love feeling that way and not being able to say, hey, Gus, can you help me? You know, and I may not have all the answers, but I've become a part of the crew. I've become a part of the team that actually makes them better. That's That's got to be the greatest thing a human being can do. It just has to be. Um, and I refuse to listen to the garbage of people going, oh, you just got to get on with it, you know. Well, if we just want to get on with it, and I'm sure I understand we need to be hardworking, we need to be resilient, 
but we're changing the rules of what it takes to be a man and a woman. And one of those has got to be the feelings around talking about your emotions because we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Well, you know, the stats, seven, three, 65,000. So I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I want to, I want to be a part of a solution, not the problem. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, I do mindset coaching outside of podcasting and, you know, the way in which I framework it is, you know, come in first of all with just providing the safe space like you're talking about and just listening. Like you don't need to interject. You don't need to correct whatever. You don't need to agree with whatever someone's saying, but just give them the space to just let you know what's going on in their life. And then, you know, when they sort of feel that sense of relief or they feel like they've got space to start thinking about things, then do something about it. Then you can get in the fix it mode or the action mode. And I've heard you speak about that, Gus, particularly when it comes to men, you know, they can tend to kind of just straight away kind of panic and be like, here's a nail, I've got a hammer, let's go. (laughs) Exactly. And normally within a minute and a half of the conversation starting, that's the, you know, and, and and I get that too because it's like, oh, my God, I'm uncomfortable now. This is strange. We're not talking about the footy. We're not talking about our girls. We're not talking... Oh, I'm out of control. So fix, 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 fix. So we need to learn how to listen. You know, someone said to me, two ears, one mouth. We should use them, right. you know, on that proportion. Um, and I struggle with that myself at times. I've become, I'm becoming better at it. But, yeah, sitting in awkward, vulnerable silence yeah. is the hardest thing to do. So, But if it really means something to you and you really love that person and you care about them, then suck it up and man up and speak up. Uh, man up and listen rather than man up, bury it like we've been told to do. Um, I think that's the only way forward because you can see where it's got us doing it the other way. But, you know, in terms of those stats, you know, 65,000 attempts, most of those are women. So we've got a problem right across our society, you know. So it's not just the suicide, but it's the attempts. It's the it's the feeling of anxiety and depression that goes with, um, you know, those stats. So, you know, we need to look after everyone and, I think off the Man Up program, you know, it was very much focused on men. And then a couple of people came to us and said, we've got some really good program for, for others. And we went, right, oh, let's let's yeah. let's try it out. And my daughter's school tried it out. And my daughters were just like, this is the best dad, so good. So we said, okay, well, let's support, let's support them. So we'll support anyone that works in prevention as long as we feel that it's something that we we can get behind. And whether it's funding or whether it's just advice or people that I know that can help the business or help with them get their stuff out. You know, that's what it's all about is, you know, we'll do it if we all are part of this village or trying to help. Beautiful, Gus. And I, again, I truly honor for all of the work that you've done um, and and are doing. And I know particularly in the preventative space, it's sometimes hard to really feel those tangible results because you're obviously preventing things. But um, yeah, you're obviously staying the course and you're a true warrior for that. So again, I really honor you. Thank you. I, yeah, it is hard sometimes and and you just see the numbers and you go, oh, and you, then someone says, mate, what would the numbers be if you weren't doing it? And right. I go, oh, that's good to know. And there's other good people doing the same thing. So we talk and try to, but I remember being at the suicide prevention conference a couple of years ago and I was the keynote speaker to end the, the conference. And I'm like, let's get some energy in the room. Come <laughs> on, let's go. Because people are just exhausted, right? Because right. everyone that works in this space is just so tired. They've given so much of their emotional muscle. It was the end of three days. They'd obviously been networking and learning and listening. And I said, we are the prevention people. So we should be the most up. And, of course, I've, you know, I've flown into Melbourne, you know, yeah, yeah. Born, <laughs> do my thing nice. and fly out again. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just sitting there going, don't be a dickhead, mate. Like, you know. Give them all a break. But yeah. my point was we need to entrust and need to infuse some real momentum into the prevention area because we are very tired, you know, and that's why you you need fresh blood and sh- people that are sh- a bit of a shit stirrer, which I've been called at times, is to, <laughs> you know, to, I, I don't mind that because it just gets the conversation more talking about prevention. There's too much focus on the, on the crisis point and, you know, this whole lockdown in, parts of Australia at the moment where millions of people are locked down you know we need to have that 11 o'clock press conference which we have in Sydney and I think it's 10 30 or 10 in in Victoria we need to say this is the date where we're going to get to 70 percent vaccination on the levels that we're going at the moment and if you get vaccinated that date will come forward 
And every day that's the date. And that gives us an opportunity to circle the number in the calendar, look forward to it, start planning parties, start planning opportunities to see friends and loved ones. And that gives you hope. And as you know, as a human being, that's the thing we need the most of. And at the moment, we just don't quite have that. So we need to change the the, the narrative. Yeah, I agree. And and particularly, you know, it's hard when we put that power into the the government's hands. So, you know, if we don't if we don't get that, then I would definitely recommend and encourage you to pick something that you can control, put it in the calendar like Gus is saying, circle it and get excited for it because it does genuinely help. The moment that you don't have a compelling future, things begin to deteriorate. So if you've got nothing yeah. to look forward to, you can do your friendship little exercise today and also write something down that you're excited for and put it in your calendar. So thanks, Gus, for, for being here. I, I really appreciate this conversation. It's my pleasure. And just one little thing for your listeners. Um, once they've written down the list and they've given themselves a mark out of 10, be as honest as possible. Um, go to the people that are obviously at a three or a four out of 10 and, and send them a text message. That's all you have to do initially because it might just sit there and go, you know what? There's so much on here. I don't know quite how to start. Well, it's a real simple text message that you can send, but it's also is a, makes you a little bit vulnerable, which starts right. this conversation. It makes you think this is something a little bit different. So send them this text message. I love you. No bullshit Stand emojis. Off easy what there, think? Gus. <laughs> yeah, we're going for we're it. We're leaning right? in. <laughs> we're leaning in. I love you. I miss you. See you soon. Kiss, hug, kiss, hug. Beautiful. And just send it. I love you. I miss you. See you soon. Kiss, hug, kiss, hug. And send it. Send it to those people and wait for your responses. You'll get, are you day drinking again? Or <laughs> you'll get, was this message for me? Or you'll get probably an, a combination of those. But eventually it'll be a connection between someone that you love that you haven't spoken to in a while and you need to work on your relationship with them. So it's just a really nice icebreaker. And we want to try to simplify and humanise this as much as possible. So just sending out something like that, it takes 10 seconds for each person, you know, cut and paste, cut and paste, send them off and just see what you get back. And over the next few days, you'll have, have end up having some really fun conversations, some really fun connections. And if you don't need it, you just don't know what the other person on the right. other end getting that message. They, that could be the number one best thing that they've got in the last couple of days. And I think, you know what, it's awesome that someone loves me and is connected with me. And that might just be enough to get their human spirit back up again because you just don't know what people are going through because we're bloody good at hiding our true feelings. It's just beautiful, Gus. So speaking of the human spirit, I'd love to ask yeah. you, Gus, what does it mean to you to be human? Uh, I think it's the greatest gift that we can get. Um, I used to start thinking, oh, I wish I was a bit less human. I wish I had made less mistakes and I wish that I was better at life. Um, but as I said at the start of the podcast, you know, my life changed a lot when I was 47, about five years ago. And I realised that this beautiful world that we're in, we've got to have the ups and downs. We've got to we've got to be human for it to be real because life will throw you all sorts of uh, stuff and you can't just expect to be able to waltz through and tick all the boxes all the time. So, yeah, for, for me, being human is actually being human. You know, we've got emotions, we've got tears. Why don't we have permission to, to, to cry when we want to cry and so forth and to be who we want to be at times and muscle up and other times to be really, you know, gentle and kind and, and loving. I think we should allow ourselves to have all those different parts of being human. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to the next sort of 30 years of my life where I'm, you know, doing what I'm doing here, but grandchildren and just seeing my God kids grow up and all the people that I love in this world and, and cherish it as much as I can.